Hi, I'm Keith Wiener, CEO of Monetary Metals. Today I want to talk about fundamental analysis of gold and silver, supply and demand. So there's a number of approaches that one reads commonly if one reads in the gold and silver community online. And I want to go through the various methods and then I want to talk about what I think is the right method. So first, we see a lot of articles that talk about what the central banks are doing, the Fed is printing and the ECB is printing and they're abusing their currencies. Uh, a lot of these articles point out that every paper currency in world history uh, that's ever been attempted has failed. There's the Continental and the Assignat and so forth. And that's all true. These are reasons to own gold, but it doesn't necessarily give you information to trade gold. And that's the problem. If we're interested in trading gold, this is not tradable information. Another type of analysis does what I call smart money, dumb money analysis. It says, well look here, the sovereign wealth fund of China is buying gold, or the Indians in India are buying gold or silver. Uh, and again, this may be true, but the problem with this analysis is that it assumes that the high profile and very often single entity buyer is smart and the thousands and thousands of sellers are the dumb money and that may be true at times, but that may not necessarily be true. Um, another problem with this is that the high-profile buyer may not actually be a buyer, but an arbitrageur. Long in one market, short in another market, but if this market doesn't have any visibility or the regulators don't track it, and this is the one that's high-profile, one could be uh, misled into thinking that there was a huge buy here when it wasn't necessarily. A third problem with this especially when they start to focus on retail coin sales, for example, is that you're only looking at a tiny corner of the market. Uh, as we discussed in a previous video, if retail coins see an increase in demand, that could drive up the premiums, but that has to do with manufacturing capacity limitations and stamping on coins, and nothing to do with the global uh, bullion market. Another style of analysis attempts to do what, it, what is called supply and demand analysis by looking at the output of the gold and silver mines and then by looking at consumption numbers either in the jewelry industry, electronics, and other places that consume metal. The problem is that as we've talked about in past videos, gold and silver have very, very, very high uh, stocks to flows ratios. This is inventories divided by annual mine production. And so, again, we're only looking at a very small part of the market so, for example, in gold, uh, about 1 80th of the total stockpile of gold is produced every year by the miners. Incremental changes, whether the miners produce 5% more gold this year than last year, or 2% less, have a very small effect on the overall market. Uh, and that is because every one of those ounces that's been accumulated over thousands of years is potentially supply at the right price. And every human being on the planet is potentially demand for gold, again, gold being money, uh, everybody has potential demand for gold at the right price. So by looking at miners and by looking at electronics and jewelry, one is only looking at a small corner of the market. And this corner is not necessarily an accurate uh, proxy for the, the total market. Another variant of this um, supply and demand analysis is looking at either COMEX inventories, that's how many ounces are stored in the warehouses that are uh, recognized and eligible by the uh, futures market, or, or the open interest and how many contracts there are, or people like to look at the exchange traded funds such as GLD and SLV and how many ounces they have in inventory. And again, it's a variant of the smart money, dumb money analysis, where you say, well, if, inv if ounces are going over here, that must be an increase but it neglects the fact that ounces came from somewhere else. So shifting ounces around from here to here doesn't necessarily, sometimes it can be meaningful, but it doesn't necessarily uh, tell you that tomorrow the price is, is likely to rise. Uh, finally, there's a very different kind of analysis that I think uh, more agile and more sophisticated traders use, and that is technical analysis. And this is the art, as part art and part science, of drawing graphs of past price action over some period of time, which could be minutes, hours, days, weeks, or months, or years, and plotting how the uh, price has moved, and then from there trying to deduce uh, where the price is likely to go next. Now the interesting thing with technical analysis, sometimes it works like a charm, uh, and part of that I think is because um, 
there's a self-fulfilling prophecy that everybody uh, understands the same rules for technical analysis, everybody of course is looking at the same chart, and when something happens, everybody knows what's supposed to come next, and so then they make it happen by either buying because they're supposed to buy or selling when they're supposed to sell. Um, I would submit for your consideration that the challenge with technical analysis is that it's an incomplete picture. If there's a breakout, it can't tell you necessarily whether that is a real breakout or whether that's a head fake. Uh, so recently, for instance, in Silver, we put out an article, it's a dump trade last week's story in Silver, suggesting that uh, this is not a real breakout, this is a uh, head fake. Um, this is as of early September, I'm making this uh, video in 2013. So instead, we suggest a different approach to supply and demand analysis, fundamental analysis of the gold and silver market. And so uh, because this is a commodity of high stocks to flows, there are certain concepts that work. And so I'd like to use the analogy of the wheat market. For example, right before the wheat harvest is delivered to the green elevators, if you were to go there and demand, how much money will you charge me to fill my truck up with wheat this afternoon, you may get a very high price, let's call it $25 a bushel. If, on the other hand, you were willing to sign a contract for delivery in a month, then you might get a very different price of, let's say, $7 a bushel. That inverted spread, the fact that it is expensive to buy it in the spot market and cheap to buy it in the futures market, is called backwardation, and what that means is scarcity or shortage. The proof of this is that if anybody had any actual wheat lying around in their warehouse, what could they do? They could put on an arbitrage that says, um, sell spot and buy a future, they would have exactly the same wheat position they had before, a month later when the future delivered, but they would tend to compress that spread and uh, take a lot of free profit in the process. The fact that nobody is taking that proves that nobody has the wheat. As we know, wheat is perishable, nobody keeps a permanent hoard of wheat, and so it's logical that right before the harvest comes in, there is actually a scarcity of wheat. Uh, but in the case of gold, we just said that there's 80 years of current production rates of gold in inventory. There is a permanent hoard of gold, we call it money. So what does it mean if there's backwardation in gold? It means there is an actual scarcity, an actual shortage. And this can be used to analyze the market and understand it and trade it. And so if I want to leave you with one take home point, it's that these other methods don't necessarily give you a clear and accurate picture, but the monetary metals Supply and demand report gives it a clear picture of fundamentals of supply and demand in the gold and silver market.